So we're going to start by looking at the calculus of vector valued functions, which is chapter 13. We aren't going to spend a lot of time in this chapter. Most of this chapter is building some of the tools that we'll need for subsequent chapters later in the course. So our learning goals for this set of videos is to compute derivatives and integrals of vector value functions, to interpret derivatives of vector value functions geometrically using tangent vectors, to use integrals and derivatives in word problems, to compute the arc length of a path, to compare arc length parameterizations to other types of parameterizations, to compute the speed along a path given by a vector valued function, and finally to compute and give geometric interpretation of the unit tangent vector, curvature, and unit normal vector of a given vector valued function. So starting with section 13.2, let's let r of t be a vector valued function. Then the derivative of r of t is the derivative of each of the component functions. So it's the derivative of the first component function and the x coordinate, of the y component function and the y coordinate, and the z component function and the z coordinate. This is exactly what you think it might be. So for example, if we were to let r of t be the vector valued function 3t squared comma cosine t comma e to the 2t. If I take the derivative of this vector valued function, I'm going to take the derivative of each of the components. The derivative of 3t squared is 6t. The derivative of cosine t is negative sine t. And the derivative of e to the 2t by chain rule, it's the derivative of 2t, which is 2 times the derivative of e to that function, which is e to the 2t. Notice, just like derivatives from single variable functions, this derivative, or the, the original function is a vector valued function, and the derivative also is a vector valued function. The output is a vector and the input is a parameter t. If we wanted to, we could evaluate this function at a given fixed value for t, such as r prime of 1 would, in this case, well, I guess I could plug in one, but um, so it can be both evaluated at a single point or thought of as a vector uh, valued function. Next, let's take a look at some theory and geometry of vector valued functions. So by definition, r prime of t, the derivative of a vector valued function r, is given by which, well, it could be written in Leibniz notation if we wanted to, d dt of r of t, and it's equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of r of t plus h minus r of t all divided by h. Notice that this difference quotient here is exactly what we saw in Calc 1. It's exactly the same definition. The only difference is instead of using a normal single variable real valued function, we're using a vector valued function. And instead of having the input be x, our input is the parameter t, which typically st stands for time. What does this mean graphically? Well, let's let r of t be a vector valued function. So here's the origin. And our function has outputs that are a whole bunch of vectors. They could be in r3 or they could be in r2. And let's say that these vectors trace some space curve. This is my picture of the space curve and my function r of t. And let's fix one of these vectors. We'll call this vector r of t, not. It's a particular value of t. And as I go h seconds into the future, I will have a different output vector. Let's call this r of t naught plus h. Notice that adding h doesn't add um, a certain fixed amount of distance. Instead, it's adding a certain period of whatever this parameter is, which typically we represent with time. Let's relate this back to the difference quotient. We know that we're taking the limit of r of t plus h minus r of t. This is a difference of two vectors, and the difference of these vectors can be represented visually by this vector. 
because the sum of r of t and this with the vector r of t plus h minus r of t, I add these two vectors together and it'll give me my r of t naught plus h vector. I should have t naughts there. We're talking about a specific value of t. And notice that as my h value gets smaller and smaller, the amount of time that elapses as I go from r of t to r of t plus h gets less and less. And so it means that as this limit has my h approaching zero, it means these vectors, my r of t plus h vectors, will get closer and closer and closer to r of t, and this difference vector is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Visually, you can see that because this difference is the limit of all of these secant vectors, that the limiting vector is going to be exactly tangent at this point. But the limit of this difference by itself is going to be a vector of length 0, right? Because as h goes to 0, in this case, this is just going to collapse. But that's not what the, the derivative is. The derivative is not just this vector. It's this vector divided by our h, which is also going to 0. To visualize what's happening, let's consider the length of this whole vector. Recall that the length of a vector is also called the magnitude of that vector. And we denote the magnitude of a vector by double absolute, bracket, absolute value brackets. So the length of a vector, also called the magnitude of the vector, we're going to look at the magnitude or length of this vector. And the length of this vector is going to be the limit as h approaches 0 of the magnitude of t, r of t plus h minus r of t, all divided by h. But h is just a constant. I can pull that constant outside of the vector. So notice that we actually have, it's the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over h times the magnitude of r of t plus h minus r of t. This sort of looks like gibberish, right? I'm getting to a point. This actually gives us something really spectacular in just a second. What is the magnitude of r of t plus h minus r of t? It's the length of this vector right here. So it's the amount of distance that the particle travels from time t to time t plus h as this is it's the approximate distance that is traveled and as h gets smaller and smaller that approximate distance gets closer and closer to the actual distance that's traveled along the curve so that's what's in the numerator what's in the denominator h that's the change in time so notice i just said that this limit is exactly equal to the change in distance over the change in time. Because my change in time, how much is time elapsing? It's elapsing h seconds, or units of time. And how far is it traveling? That can be approximated by the magnitude of this vector. So what is this change in distance over change in time? That's exactly speed. So what did I just say? This means that r prime of t has direction that's exactly tangent to my space curve, tangent to the space curve. And the length, the magnitude r prime of t, is the speed. What vector is described by the direction of the vector is the tangent vector, and the, speed, the magnitude of the vector is the speed. That means that r prime of t is a velocity vector. Now, if all of this went a little bit quickly, that's okay. We're going to review it when we look at 13.3 in a little depth. I just thought that it was nice to see from first principles how the fact that the derivative vector is exactly tangent 
to the space curve, and it has length that's the speed at that point, meaning that our derivative vector is a velocity vector. Next, let's look at integration. Integration works like we want it to work, much like derivatives. The integral of a vector-valued function is going to be the integral of each of the component functions. And like we were just saying, if r of t is a position vector, then the derivative of that is the velocity vector, and the second derivative is going to be the acceleration vector. I'm not going to go through the derivation for this relationship. But it means that if we want to work backwards, let's say we're given an acceleration vector, I would have to take the antiderivative to be able to derive the velocity vector, and I could take the antiderivative of that to get back to the position vector. Let's look at one final example. Suppose we have a plane and it has a velocity given by the vector valued function v of t equals 2t 3t squared. And at time t equals 1, the plane has position p of 1 equals 5, 3, 2 thirds. We're asked to find the position and acceleration functions for the plane. So recall, let's put this paper down, that in this problem, we're given the velocity vector. I want to focus this again. We're given the velocity vector, and we're asked to find the position vector, and we're also asked to find the acceleration vector. So to move from the velocity vector to the excel. I just noticed that I spelled acceleration wrong. No wonder it was confusing me so much. Um, to move from the velocity vector to the acceleration vector, we're going to have to take a derivative. So v of t is given by 2t, 3t squared. If I want to find the acceleration vector, I'm going to take the derivative of this. So my acceleration vector, which is equal to the derivative of my velocity vector, which is given by the derivative of 2t is just t, the derivative of 3 is 0, and the derivative of t squared is 2t. Sorry, the derivative of 2t is 2. I apologize. I'm not sure why I was looking too far ahead. So this means that our acceleration vector is given by the vector 2, 0, 2t. If we wanted to go back and find the position vector, the position vector is going to be the antiderivative of the velocity vector. So let's look at the antiderivative of our velocity vector. Like we just said, it's going to be the antiderivative of each of the components, the antiderivative of 3 dt, and the antiderivative of t squared dt. I'm going to compute this simply. So the antiderivative of 2t is going to be by polynomial rule t squared. 2 divided by 2 is 1, and I end up with just t squared as a first component function. But notice that this is an indefinite integral, so I'm going to need to add on a constant. For the next component function, the antiderivative of 3 becomes 3t plus a constant. And for the final component function, I end up with 1 third t cubed plus a constant. The thing that I want to point out that's important to note, note, these constants may not be equal. So we're going to have to use our initial condition to solve to find out what these constants will be. And we were given the fact, so this is equal to our position. We were given the fact that when I plug in 1 for t, I get out the vector 5, 3, 2 thirds. And that's exactly equal to t squared plus c1, 3t plus c2, and 1 third t cubed plus c3. I'm running out of space. I'm just recopying this over again. So this leaves us with three different equations that we have to solve. 
I know that 5, the first component function, has to be equal to t squared plus c1 when t is equal to 1. So I get that 5 is equal to 1 plus c1, and that means that my first constant, c1, is equal to 4. For the next equation, for the second component function, I find that 3 is equal to 3 times 1, which is 3, plus c2. So we know that c2 is equal to 0. And then for our final component function, when I plug in 1 to the final equation, I find that 2 thirds is equal to 1 third plus c3. So that means that in this case, c3 must be equal to 1 third. Thus, our final function for position is given by p of t is equal to t squared plus c1, which is 4. Our second component function is 3t plus c2, which is 0. And our third component function, 1 third t cubed plus c3, which is equal to 1 third.